You're listening to Discography Discussion, episode 243, Cave In. Hosted by Dan Terry. Still brought the house down. And Joseph Wren. You had me at the galloping guitars. Presented by DiscussMetal.com. And if you search for daylight while the walls are caving in, then you are ready for this episode of Discography Discussion. I am Joe. That is Dan. Oh, hey, that's me. I'm here. I'm, I'm on the show. We're, we're talking about cave-in. I'm a human being, and I'm still alive, and we're talking about cave-in. I love it. I love it. Um, I love it, too. A- I have to say, this band was a breath of fresh air. Then it wasn't. Then it was again. <laughs> when, when was it? When was it not a breath of fresh air? So I'm much. We want to be space rock. There were times I wanted to compare it to Hum, a little bit of Hope's Fall. Brian Patton's not around, is he? Brian Patton talking about Hope's Fall is not real. He can't <laughs> hurt you. He absolutely cannot hurt you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I get the I get the Hope's Fall consp- conspiracy. No, not conspiracy. Careful, dude. Those get- padded walls are closing in on you. Is that like the wolves are closing in? <laughs> I I understand that the Hope's Fall sort of musical arc is very similar to that of Caven's musical arc. Both bands started off as kind of this like harsh metalcore sort of thing. The difference is though is that Hope's Fall was always deeply melodic, and Caven was well they weren't man <laughs> they just weren't you know and I and I think that like. Cave In, I appreciate a lot, and I, I love. I okay, I like Hope's Fall more than I like Cave In. I don't think they're the same band, Brian, uh, and I'm not comparing them directly, Brian. Uh, but I do think that you know they have some similarities, and, and we're going to get into them. We're going to get into them tonight, uh, or what, whatever time you're choosing to listen to this. Could be first thing in the morning, for all I know. Uh, Hope's Fall was always melodic. Cave In started off very, 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 very harsh. And then they put out probably one of two of it really in my opinion the in my opinion the two best kind of spacey rock albums that I've ever heard. Which are those? Oh, well I mean that would be that would be Jupiter uh, and, uh, and, and 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 Antenna, Antenna and Jupiter. You know, I think I think they're they're two of the greatest albums that have ever graced my ears. I, I don't know about you. But uh, but I also have a, a genuine love of the pre Jupiter Cave In because they play exactly the type of hardcore metalcore music that I am a fan of. It was an interesting journey to go from that style of music to everything we love about Hope's Fall and Hum and more of these droning bands that build soundscapes without using too many electronics or having 17 keyboardists in the band. There's something to be said for just groove it out and let the song build and be what it is, guys. It's all about the pedals. It's all about your, 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 your selection of amazing effects pedals. Well, before Dan constructs a shoegaze masterpiece, I'm going to take this time to say thank you to everyone for listening to the podcast. Thank you for listening and for subscribing. If you are not a subscriber, then you can find everything discography discussion at discussmetal.com. We are on Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, iHeartRadio. So if you have an Amazon Echo or a Google Home, you have no excuse. Ask it to play the latest episode of the Discography Discussion podcast, and it will. We're also on Facebook and on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Be sure to like, favorite, and subscribe. It really helps us out. It lets us know you're listening. And now Dan is going to tell us all about five-star reviews. You know, we do enjoy getting some reviews here on the podcast. And if you leave us a review, we will 100% read it on the show. And uh, if you guys keep sharing and commenting on the episodes, we will also make sure to read those on the show, which is what I'm going to do right now. Uh, over on Patreon, who gets, you know, top billing, uh, we got a comment from Dangerous Dave in response to our Chopping Mall episode. And uh, I had mentioned during that episode that it would be really cool to have Chopping Mall on the show. I have since reached out to Chopping Mall and, uh, and I'm awaiting a response. Every day I check my email and I I get really sad when I don't have a response from, from Chopping Mall. I, I just got to have it. Are, are you sure that it. your parents would want you talking to the brains behind Chopping Mall, Dan? I mean, I don't care because I'm a rebel. I listen to heavy bands like like the Foo Fighters, <laughs> so you know I'm good. 
I, I think I'm good. Over on Facebook, we got a comment uh, saying, I just found your podcast recently, randomly going. This was posted by Jason Robert Grace, by the way. Want to make sure you're attributed for your comment. Uh, found your podcast recently and randomly going through your old episodes. Um, and I'm shocked that you guys haven't covered Queen's Reich yet, considering the fascinating backstory and highly inconsistent output from the Tate lead years and the surprising quality from the new version of the band. That uh, I think this is an epic episode that's missing from your catalog. Um, I don't think that we were like not going to talk about uh, Queen's Reich. I think that they, it's always been a plan. Uh, Jeff Tate spells his name the correct way, according to Jeff. <laughs> you know, it's it's like it's like G off, right? Or, or G off. Step one, talk about Def Leppard. Step two, start talking about more bands that play guitar. Step four, Queensryche. So you're going to are, get it eventually, you, I'm sure. Are you suggesting that we talk about bands that don't play guitars <laughs> on the show? I think there's a difference between bands that make sounds with guitars and bands that play riffs or what would be conventionally referred to as riffs because back in the 80s and the 90s, it was all about that guitar, right? I mean, it basically was. I mean, if, if Iron Maiden's drumming is to, is anything to go off of, <laughs> then yeah, it was definitely the guitars. I mean, that that's honestly why I didn't even hear the drums when I was listening to Iron Maiden. Dan I was like, it doesn't really matter. doesn't all. want to talk about Iron Maiden's new album on Patreon. I did. I did it already. I'm not going to lie to you guys. We did it. We did it like not that long ago. Okay, so you, you just have to wait for that to come out. What kind of perks are you going to get if you sign up for Patreon, Dan? What kind of perks? Well, um, let's see. Number one, you can watch us record the episodes live where we're a little bit more loosey-goosey. You get to see us crack up, and we don't sound so stone-cold professional uh, as we probably do on the final product. <laughs> and uh, I find that very enjoyable. Every now and again, we we pull up troll videos on those on those live recording sessions you know when we need a break or or whatever but uh not only would you get these uh live stream episodes just for you you'll also get access to a massive archive of individual album reviews i think it's like two years worth one one per week for the last two years so quite a bit it's been a while we, there, there's a lot you, it'll take you a minute to get through all of that and the asking price on that is like one dollar a month so i mean it's you know it, it's one of the best and uh it, it's one of the best perks we have not only that, but you get your episodes. Uh, you get your episodes early, and um, you know you also get to hang out with us every month. We do what we do a Patreon hangout that usually lasts anywhere from Jesus, I don't know, anywhere from ninety minutes to four hours. I think at, at one point, <laughs> uh, we we play Jackbox games. We we talk about our feelings. We do each other's nails. We all have a great time together on uh, the Patreon hangout. Uh, I think that's enough corporate shilling for us tonight. So, Dan, tell me about Cave In. Well, Cave In is an interesting band. If you if you ask the band today what kind of music that they play, they're going to tell you that they are a rock band, and they're not far off the mark. This is a band that started off in the hardcore, like the 90s hardcore metalcore scene, if you can even call that a scene at the time. It was more like a whole bunch of bands that lived far away from each other, like sending demo tapes to each other and playing in like VFW halls and and in really disgusting bars that you normally wouldn't just go to. So that that's where Caven kind of gets their primordial start. And uh, right off the bat, there there's a little bit of house cleaning I need to do with Caven. You're going to start off with a controversial statement. It's not going to be controversial. It's just that like we get continually beat into the ground uh, for not talking about EPs. And like we have another episode uh, that it, that is coming around, around the same time as this one where a good portion of the band's material is on EPs and cave is kind of the same way. And as you guys know, I made a rule a long time ago saying that we weren't going to talk about EPs on the show. That format seems to work out the best for us. So we kind of have kept it there. Um, cave going to be the same thing, and they've, they've kind of hacked our system a little bit here because for most of my life, I thought that the second, or the, no, I'm sorry, I thought that the first Cave-In album was an album called Beyond Hypothermia. I, I listened to it, I'd show it to people, I'd say, yeah, this one. This one's the first one. <laughs> you know? Uh, but it turns out that Beyond Hypothermia is actually a compilation of early Cave-In demos 
where they went in, they, they re-recorded some vocals, they re-recorded some guitars, they spruced it up a little bit, they made it nice, and it sounds for a mid ninety or for a late nineties metalcore release, it sounds really good. So I always thought that that was one of their albums, you know, or was their debut album. Turns out that it's not. It's a compilation album, which doesn't fall under our normal sort of coverage guidelines. Now we told we just got done talking for an hour about Patreon. But uh, if you guys want us to do something with EPs on Patreon, please let us know. Um, if you want to hear us dig deeper into some of these bands, uh, you just got to tell us. We can't we can't read your mind. You know, just to say, hey, yo, throw something up like that on the Patreon and maybe we'll do it. Um, but we're going to start this episode off with the actual first debut studio album by Cave In. 1998, Until Your Heart Stops. Brutal. So much heavy. You had me at the galloping guitars. This is this is some kind of like deep and dirgy uh, sort of music. You said Joe couldn't say it, but I I can I can still say it. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, this is slower paced with a with a huge emphasis on heaviness and changing riffs every ten to fifteen seconds. Uh, the band is not quite at the level of. Uh, um, you know, metalcore masters, and that's what I kind of like about this record. Uh, it's a little dirty, it's a little disjointed in places, and I love it. This is exactly what I like metalcore to sound like in the late 90s. Uh, let's do our hardcore part, guys. Okay, now let's jump over into our metal part. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Yeah, let's throw it all together. Okay, How, what are we at? We're at three, three, three minutes. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's a song. Let's go. Let's write the next one. All metalcore um, riffs have to count to nine. You know that, right? Every t- every single one. Chicka dick dump. Ticket, ticket, dump. I know for me, this is what I expect thrash influenced metalcore to sound like. It's got the riffs, it's got the gallop, but then the vocals have that everyone in the band has a microphone type sound. So it works. It builds that energy, that punk rock feel of everybody's going to go to the show. We're going to fucking throw down for the next 35 minutes. We're going to take a break, and then the next band is going to come up and do the same thing. I enjoy this album more than I should. It reminds me a lot of early Blindside, the way it sonically sounds. It reminds me of just when we used to jam in the basement. Like, I kind of always go back to that place where it's like, you know, Joe's got his guitar strapped on. He's like, okay, I'm going to just, um, what do you think about this? And of course, me never working with, you know, anybody that could actually write music before. I'm like, yeah, it sounds great. Let's do it. You know, like like that sort of, that sort of, um, unrestrained creativity and these guys obviously are just like let's be as heavy as possible let's be as emotional as possible uh you know because like e- even when i was in the garage it was like well i'm not much of a singer but we threw some singing parts on it too just because we felt at the time that the music had to have that you know to some degree so you know cave in i feel like kind of having the same sort of idea throws out the eight minute song the end of our rope is a noose and uh you get some like fun, melodic, clean sort of sort of vocals, and what really what really separates this from even I think beyond hypothermia is it's pretty obvious that from an early from an early point this band wanted to be more creatively interesting than their peers, right? So you get songs like "Until Your Heart Stops," you know, Seg Two. They do Seg One, Seg Two. They're good and bottom feeder seg three. Like they, they try to keep a theme going and they, between their heavier parts, they try to throw in these more like noisy atmospheric sort of interludes. It's not like melodic, put you to sleep music, uh, but it's enough to, it's enough for you to take notice and be like, okay, there might be a little bit more to this band than just let's scream and, and play breakdowns and, and, and be heavy. And you start seeing little bitty glimpses of the rock band that is hiding underneath all of this sort of metal veneer. Everybody clearly wanted to play the fastest, heaviest, and be the most hardcore band in the room that could actually put a riff together. It's hard to explain why some bands that are chaotic for the sake of being chaotic don't work when this band is clearly introducing some chaos into the songwriting. And I think the best answer is these guys can actually play. 
So when you have a band that can actually play, they can be random. They can be chaotic and still get the point across. And it has to sound interesting. There has to be a reason to come back to it. And this one strikes me as one of the best first albums for a band that sounds like this. It's interesting that the style will not continue for Cave In. Yeah, they they kind of just like you you know that you, well, what you're getting on this record really is you're getting the raw talent. You're getting the raw talent that these guys have. These ideas of like the, having these greater ideas of a much higher scope than what you get out of a lot of bands that get together in a garage and decide that they just want to be heavy. We, we've all done that. We've all gotten in the garage and decided that we wanted to be heavy. These guys are like, we want to be heavy, but we also want to show off some of this other stuff that we can do. And I think they even realized early on that if they kept going in that style, these guys easily could have gotten heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier and become a Converge. Uh, or they could have become a Coalesce. Or they could have become a Zeo. Or something something just very uh, visceral. And for whatever reason, for whatever reason, they decided to not go that way. And uh, they ended up uh, really putting their heads together and really uh, consolidating their chops into something that, uh, honestly, based on that first record, I could tell was possible, but wasn't actually expecting. Was anybody expecting Jupiter in the year 2000? I mean, I wasn't expecting it, but I was here for it. Uh, Jupiter is everything I like. Uh, about spacey rock music. It's even hard to even call this metal. I mean, it, it's more metal than the, than the next record is. Um, and they're not quite they're not quite there yet. They're they're playing very musically interesting heavy space rock uh, on Jupiter. Which I mean, if I was going to write out a recipe for things that I want out of a record, that would be the exact recipe. Um, they're writing actual songs here. They're actually writing more compositions. They're they're going a little bit more for the artsy. They're going in the more artsy direction here, where they're like, "All right, we're gonna compose, you know, roughly six to nine minute songs. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna mostly sing them. <laughs> we're gonna build up to heavier parts. Uh, we're gonna take these songs. We're gonna take these listeners on a musical journey throughout this record." of that whole just floating through space feeling that I that I love so much. Um, I was initially thrown off by the vocals on uh, on Jupiter. I don't necessarily think that the clean vocals are quite there yet. They're close, but they're not quite there yet. This is this is this is the unfortunate reality of it being a first try at something like this and basically being good enough to get past it. I don't think the vocals are bad here. I just think that they could be better if they'd had a more professional s singer at the time. I think this record probably could have been bigger than it was. The vocals make sense in the year 2000. I don't know exactly what they were going for. I can't call it emo, but it doesn't sound that far off from what you would hear on the radio at that time. Everybody forgets that Blink-182 used to be the biggest band in the world for a couple of years, depending on how old you were. So that slightly off-pitch style of melodic singing, I could see a lot of people jumping onto it because it doesn't sound so clean. I think for me, in 2000, I would have been extremely thrown off by it, but the instrumentation would have pulled me back in. I think this fits in very well with a band like Candiria. This could be the opening act because it's in that same vein of composition where pushing the boundaries a little bit just to make you uncomfortable enough to pay attention to what we're doing. Yeah. And I think a band like cave is interesting because this is it. Like, at least for me, this is like the original band where like my friends are all listening to like radio alternative radio rock from the nineties and early two thousands. And like, I think all of that stuff's really, really cool. And I think you're right. I think vocally we're not really, the vocals seem to be more inspired by my 90s and 2000s hard rock, you know, than anything else. Um, I even give it like a little bit of the J, like you could kind of tell where Jay Forrest was was trying to do uh, whenever, he, whenever he started putting the melodic vocals into Hope's Well. They're very similar to this, you know, um, that sort of like 
California cool guy sort of voice. <laughs> you know, I don't really know how to, <laughs> how to how to really describe it or put it into words. But uh, what you have is a non whiny vocal that is also not like a butt rock vocal, like not a you know a, a you know not not a yarling uh, sort of thing. Uh, I don't think he's on key all the time, but I, again, I think for the year two thousand, this was pretty. Uh, par for the course, and I just love the music on this record. This is this is a record that I'll lay down on my couch behind me and blast. You know, uh, you know, I'll just put it on repeat and listen to that all night while I'm sleeping. Like that's my that that's something of my go to uh, for a band like Cave In. And um, this record has it all. You know, it's 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 a solid 45 minutes, and will take you on a musical journey. And this is so above and beyond their first sort of first few releases that it's kind of mind blowing that they got this good this quickly. Not to make a Foo Fighters comparison when it's not appropriate. The songs on this record sound bigger than the band has members. Like they were writing something that needs seven or eight people to fully fill out the sound which for the purpose of this album means the producer needs to step up and put more layers in on those guitars, take advantage of all those extra effects that the guys have on their boards. But maybe they laid back on purpose. I don't know. I do think it's one of the most interesting albums to come out in 2000 because it's just not normal. There's nothing normal about it for anyone that listens to the radio or most people that were listening to metal at that time. I could see this being labeled as emo two or three years later, and it's not that. But that's what everybody was focusing on, was those vocals that just sound like garbage compared to the illustrious tones of whatever my favorite butt rock band was singing at the time. Yeah, I mean, they're just unproduced. It's a guy singing into a microphone, and he's a good singer, but it doesn't have all those bells and whistles on it that uh, that bands had during that time period, um, and it just goes to show that if you're if what you're listening to to determine what a good singer is is, is pop music or whatever's popular in rock at the time, uh, it's usually not a good thing, <laughs> you know. Um, whereas I think that these are serviceable, and really I think my only issue is I think some of the vocal patterns weren't weren't 100% rock solid or he was trying to follow the guitar melody a little too much you know on certain things to lead to a little bit of awkwardness but I think it's I think it's a it's a solid 9 out of 10 record for me and I know for a lot of cave in fans that's blasphemy there, there's people out there that worship at the altar of Jupiter and say it's 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 this great revelation and I do think that it is all of those things um I just think that it could be a little bit better there's certain things that could be tightened up and um you know, there's certain things that could be worked on, and you could even, you could even take some of these more complex arrangements and make them more into something that would be a little bit more digested, more digestible for a wider audience. Uh, and I think that whenever the band of, of ended up uh, signing to uh, RCA, uh, this w- which was like their major label debut, I think that they. I think the producers thought that too. I think the record label thought we could tighten this up and we could we could actually sell this. 2003 Antenna. This is what I'm talking about. <laughs> so this is uh, people are going to think blasphemy. They're, they're going to turn the podcast off right now, unsubscribe, one star review. Uh, but I think that like Antenna is Antenna is a fully realized vision of what Cave In was going for on Jupiter. I think Jupiter is more complex. I think if you care more about complexity and musical integrity, you're gonna you're gonna like Jupiter more than you're gonna like Antenna. Uh, I'm kind of on the fence though because Antenna's really, really catchy. They they they've shaved they've shaved down some of the more complex, artful elements. But what you have is a really, really, really solid alternative rock record in the space rock sort of genre. Everything sounds super big and bright. Um, and I love it. I love being 2003. There's like almost no compression on this record at all. It's, it's just incredible. It just sonically sounds amazing. And I, I can't I can't gush about that enough. Like there's just nothing held back. Everything rings out nice and loud and 
there, there's multiple guitar layers going on here to create that kind of like textured sound. Um, and it just strikes me in the nostalgia feels, man. I've listened to, I've listened to Antenna more than I've listened to any other Cave In album, just because I can't get over how they absolutely should have been one of the biggest bands that year. I think, unfortunately, I don't know. I, I've gone back and forth on this. I think that if Antenna had come out in '98 this would be remembered as one of the greatest rock albums of all time. Uh, but by 2003, I don't necessarily know if this is what mainstream rock fans were looking for. It's impossible to listen to this record and not hear the hopes fall, the Jay Forrest style of chewing on your words a little bit. And I like that. I like the non-conventional approach to the lead vocals you don't have hooks necessarily but with a slightly different mindset this band would have choruses for days some of the most interesting choruses you could possibly have instead they're building these soundscapes with guitars and vocals and drums in a way that i can only describe as underground or independent it sounds like the opposite of a band who's being pushed by a producer to write interesting songs. The songs are already interesting. This is for the album listeners. Where is Jeff when I need him? Hey, y'all. Right. <laughs> you have the makings of an interesting piece of art with this. And it's not presumptuous like some bands get. It sounds very clean and even though I said they're not writing hooks, there are ideas here that I come back to that are only in the vocals. Yeah. Yeah, I like how you said, too, that you kind of choose on his words a little bit. Like, And I, and I enjoy that. It, he's being very, very musical with his voice in a way that I was kind of complaining that he wasn't as much on Jupiter. You know, it, like he, it's like... It's very, very um, refined, I guess, is the word. Like... I feel like some of these choruses may have been written and rewritten several times. Could be wrong. They could just be this good of a one-take band. <laughs> but, uh, and, you know, in seeing them live before, I, I could say that they, that could that could 100% be the case. Um, they actually just played Furnace Fest here a couple of, couple of days ago as of the recording of this uh, episode. But, uh, yeah, I just, I love this record. I know a lot of Cave-In fans don't. And look, I'm I'm the first guy that gets it 100%. When a band starts off heavy and you think they're the greatest thing in the world and that they're they're super cool being heavy and then they put out a record like Jupiter, it's not quite as heavy, but it's still metal and it's still very artful and you're like, yeah, these guys are creative geniuses. And then they put a record out and they put out a record like Antenna and you think like, okay, I feel like they've dumbed down the heaviness. They they've taken all the quote-unquote balls out of the guitars. But they, but they haven't really. They've just changed their approach. And I think that they were really, really looking to strike out on their own here and, and really do something great. Uh, and I think they 100% accomplished this. I think they 100% accomplished that on Antenna. Because, like, I still spin this thing. I still listen to it all the time because it's, in my opinion, it's one of the greatest, like, alternative rock, kind of space rock albums out there. And it's one of the most interesting to, to listen to because the band hasn't dumbed down their creativity like I think a lot of people accuse them of. I think sometimes it's harder to be creative in a commercial space than it is being a band that is than it is to be a band that nobody has any expectations for. Because once you put a record like Jupiter out, there's expectations. You know, uh, when Between the Bear and Me put out Colors, then there were expectations. <laughs> you yes, know, like, the expectations were don't try to do that again right away, guys. Right. Um, which, you know, we've talked to Ed Nosm about that. But, like, <laughs> uh, but with Cave In here, I, I think that they were very creative with a lot of their choices here. I think it's harder to take your long compositions and kind of trim them down into more digestible bits. I think that's much harder than is given credit for. And um, yeah. I think that I think that Hope's Fall, the more melodic Hope's Fall, 100% influenced by Antenna. You wouldn't have records like 
you wouldn't have records like A-Types or Magnetic North without records like Antenna by Caven. Just my opinion. 2005. Perfect Pitch Black. So, everything that we said about that record, that last record, Antenna, uh, I think the band kind of... I don't really know how to explain this uh, because I wasn't there. I'm not. I'm not a member of Cave In, but I can say that like I think maybe they got a little too they got a little too much of the main strip being on a major label treatment, where you know they put out a record like Antenna. It's the most commercially successful thing they've ever done, right? Or, or most commercial sounding thing they've ever done. And so when they go in to write a record to follow it up, you know. The label's like, okay, yeah, let's do it. Let's go. Let's go Antenna Part 2. Let's make it more accessible. Let's do this, 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 this. Thing is, is these guys all started off in a basement playing metalcore not that long ago, right? So they start getting that... They start getting kind of that hankering. I think they start they start reading the... They start kind of reading the room a little bit and seeing that like heavier bands are kind of starting to get their day in the sun around that time the 2003 2004 you've suddenly got metalcore bands on Ozfest. you've got you know um you've got everything going on in that scene and i think that they just got the old hankering for like look i really like the stuff that we did on jupiter and i really like the stuff that we did on antenna but man sometimes it feels good to do some of that old until your heart stops stuff <laughs> you know and uh and i could get that and I don't think it was like open rebellion because if you listen to pitch perfect i'm sorry not pitch perfect uh perfect pitch black um you will you still have the antenna cave in you hear that that's still there but they've added they've decided to just add like some screaming they've decided to beef it up a little bit beef up the sound and maybe uh maybe kind of appeal to those maybe vocal uh minorities that were like yo you guys ever gonna play anything heavy again uh, but I think if you can look past that, I think what you actually get with Perfect Pitch Black is a record that sounds like it should have come out before Jupiter. <laughs> but you still have kind of a lot of that spacey, kind of that spacey droning um, alternative rock sound that the band kind of became known for. Uh, but they're also just trying to like, this is the we're trying to return to our roots sort of record. And I think that when they pitched this to RCA, and I think that, like, I'm pretty sure this is how it went down, but they pitched it to RCA, and RCA is like, no, this is not, it's not the band that we signed. You know, we, we want, we don't want a metal band. We want a rock band. And uh, eventually they ended up, uh, you know, right back kind of where they were before. And uh, they went right back to Hydrahead Records that accepted them with open arms, and they put that out here. And uh, they marketed it to kind of the heavier music crowd. And uh, I think overall as an album, I don't think it's as strong as the last two are. But I do think that it has merit as a cave-in record. It's still going to be better than a lot of bands that sounded like this in 2005. Uh, but I do think that it is a little disjointed creatively. It's a little anti-stereotype when it comes to melodic space rock or even metalcore and emo at the time. You have a band who is clearly found a sound that works, and that is that laid-back space rock sound or atmospheric rock, that hum thing that's going on. And without changing the tempo most of the time, they break into these metalcore dissonant assaults. I don't know why, but that feels like a good idea. It just doesn't execute on paper. You try to change the way the audience is reacting to the music, it's going to take more than just triplets and gutturally screaming at the top of your lungs or the bottom of your lungs, depending on whether you stand up or bend over when you scream with the arm behind the back. You're welcome, Dan. <laughs> I still do that when I'm talking sometimes on the show. I just put my <laughs> arm behind my back. Well, I'm about to say something that's really going to piss a bunch of people off, right? <laughs> But it's extremely melodic when it's melodic. It feels a little anti-everything. And I don't hate it. I just don't think it's that interesting. 
It's a really good idea that doesn't have all of the pieces necessary to give me that same record I just got with Antenna. Yeah. Yeah, I feel that. I think that they I think that they were trying to have both. I think they wanted to be the heavy band that they were kind of known for being, but also still be that band. Like, cause if you, I think that if you liked Antenna, you know, and I disagree with the label here quite a bit. I think if you liked Antenna, I think you're not going to dislike Perfect Pitch Black. <laughs> you know, I don't think that you're going to have a any, any type of real problem with it. And that's how I feel about it. I don't think it's the best Cave In album, but I don't have a problem with it. I, I like listening to it. I think it has good songs. Um, I just think that it's a little disjointed is all, you know. Um, and this is kind of like where the band more or less uh, fizzled out. They ended up going on a hiatus in 2006 and uh, they took three years off and uh, they came back with a EP called Planets of Old in 2009, uh, which we're not going to get into here. Um, I will tell you that I, I enjoyed that and made me very excited for what Caven had coming next. Uh, but once they came back, they came back strong. 2011, White Silence. So they've gone back on White Silence to basically being a full-on hardcore band again, <laughs> which uh, which is important because before when they were a hardcore band, in the early days, we kind of talked about how they sounded like you know garage ideas and and all of this stuff. Uh, that's not the case here. Now you've got a band that has been around the block quite a few times. <laughs> and they can compose these frantic hardcore songs and yet still include all of the atmospheric moments that they have been perfecting throughout their career. Um, they're just doing it in a much more terrifying way uh, than they've been doing it before. I think that this is them just being like, Kaven's back. And we want to go back to what the original idea was. This is the most different sounding from like an antenna or Jupiter. It, you'd be hard pressed to even tell, like to show somebody antenna and then show them this and be like, yeah, bro, that's the same band. I think a fan of Caven at this time, Jupiter, Antenna, and to a lesser extent, Perfect Pitch Black are their albums. If White Silence kicks in, you weren't expecting this but you might know enough about the band to know that this is how it started. It's an interesting combination of atmosphere to use that dissonant hardcore sound with melodic ideas. It's something we've heard done a lot, but never like this. And now you have, for lack of a better term, you have interesting guitar leads on top of shoegaze. That's not supposed to work. You're not supposed to be able to mix old school thrash with new school. We have all these pedals and we're just making these sounds now. What I love about this record is that like, I like how side A is this like vicious pummeling hardcore record. Like, I love that. <laughs> I'm, I'm really into that. And then you get to side B, you start getting into Summit Fever and then all of a sudden we start busting out the clean vocals more. We start, we get to earthquakes, uh, our heart, heartbreaks and earthquakes. And we're like playing an acoustic guitar and singing and making scratching sounds. And like the record ends off on a very mellow note. And even though it's weird and it's not expected, it's like literally the most cave in thing ever that, that, that they would have done. Like where it's like, yeah, so we know you guys like a vicious beat you in the face hardcore band. So we're going to do that for you. And then you're going to flip the record over and we're going to become, you know, that band that was uh, a more melodic band, but we're going to keep it like really, really artsy. We're going to keep it really, really strange and unexpected. And uh, even the even, even the prettier parts, they're not pretty like they were on Antenna where the songs made you feel kind of good. You almost end up a little bit more creeped out than anything else. And um, I don't know. I'm really glad that they put this record out. It's not my favorite, but I really appreciate it for being a strong comeback and them somehow being able to incorporate everything they've ever done into 35 minutes. I like the sonic tension at the start of the album. Almost like we put too many layers on 
And instead of trying to balance them properly, we just decided to balance the building. Like we built a skyscraper upside down and now we have to balance it and keep it from falling over. And it works in the context of the record, I think because of the melodic payoff. You get to have all this sonic tension at the beginning and then it pays off by being this laid back idea. And I don't know what the story is. Where did that idea come from to blow you away at the beginning and then end with the band that made their way through the mid 2000s? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Creativity is, is a strange animal, you know? Absolutely. Uh, it's hard to it's hard to it's hard to explain. Uh, and now we have to talk about something really sad. Um, so before we get before we get to the next record, uh, final transmission. Um, uh, I remember I was uh, doing an episode of Brutally Speaking uh, with John, and uh, we were in the middle of recording an outro for an episode when all of my notifications, you know, on my phone sort of sort of exploded. Uh, where it was it was discovered that or not discovered but reported that um, you know one, one of the most valuable members of Caven uh, Caleb and I don't know how to pronounce his last name and I feel really bad but it's either Schofield um, or Scofield I think it's Schofield uh, he passed away in 2018 uh, at the age of 39 it was a car accident it was very tragic. Um, I remember getting the notification that he had passed away and um, it being um, one of the biggest bummers uh, that I've experienced in my time podcasting um, because cave was obviously from what you've heard of this episode is one of my favorite bands. And so like uh, that was that was really, really hard. But uh, it's not about how hard it was on me. It's more about how hard it was on the band who really had been discussing the idea of doing another record and they had laid down some demos. Um, and I think that it was hard because they didn't really know how to move forward with that. You know, do we replace him? Uh, Caleb was also in another band that I like a lot called old man gloom, uh, who I'd like to talk about, uh, at some point, other point on the show. And, um, they're like kind of like a post metal, like sludge and sludge man. they really heavy, really gutsy. I love it. But, um, so whenever whenever we're getting into final transmission, um, I'll kind of explain a little bit more about um, about this record and, and why it kind of sounds the way that it does. 2019. So on final transmission, um, they really didn't. Obviously, they had to take some time to, to process this. And what's interesting about it is that they had kind of started working on songs they had songs demoed out and they ended up eventually making the decision to go ahead and uh put some songs on it they, they basically grabbed some of the demos uh that caleb had sang on and had and had played on and they went ahead and used those demos and just kind of recorded around them uh, to include him on the record. So like a lot of this record is it's a finished record, but I think they're the, the focus was more to make it almost like a, um, I don't want to say a tribute because that sounds really cheesy, but like just as sort of a, a, a send off, you know, I think that's why it's called final transmission. And it's interesting because it's kind of, um, all over the place. It's not, it's not as focused uh, as the previous record, nor should it be. Um, they've definitely gone back into the space rock cave in the Jupiter and almost antenna sound uh, that they, you know, that's my kind of my favorite era of the band. And this record was definitely a, a grower on me. I listened to it a few times after it came out. And um, I was kind of like, wow, this is like really kind of forlorn and, you know, kind of all over the place but it has grown on me significantly to the point where I would put it up there with with almost something like Jupiter as far as as far as creativity goes um, I know the band has continued to perform up to this day 
Um, and I hope that they continue, but it is definitely a huge loss with Caleb being gone. And um, it was definitely it was definitely a huge loss. It was just a huge loss for for this kind of music. And uh, I think this record was a really good send off for him. This one fit in really well with the Jupiter and Antenna era of this band. I really enjoyed the throwback to that style. Not knowing the story of this album, it was surprising that eight years later, we went back to the early 2000s. So the band really went everywhere within atmospheric rock that they could. And keeping the metalcore when it worked, they weren't afraid to back off. And I think that's one of the best things about this band. They know when to push and when to lay back. And that's something I think we've only ever said about Candiria and Hope's Fall. It takes a lot of composition, knowledge, and feel to know when to push the song and when to lay back. I don't think everybody would like this album, but I think that most people listening to this album are fans of the band and they know how this album got here. The concept alone is cool to me. I remember in the 90s when the Beatles were united because you have these John Lennon demos and all you got to do is add to them and complete the songs, guys. And at least one time, for me, it worked. It was really cool. So if this band was able to do their version of that, let's take what we have and build around it. Static X did the same thing. I don't think there's a lack of examples of that thing working. So does this album work for Caven? Absolutely. It fits in with the antenna and the Jupiter. And honestly, I think that's what the diehard fans want. The metalcore is cool, but I think the majority of fans of this band want that sound. And at a time when Arbiter just came out, you know that this fit right in. I agree. It definitely grew on me. You know, for a record that was basically composed of demos, Caven's demos are still better than your demos. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I like it. Just it just is what it is. I don't even care if this had been recorded on a on a 1990s Talkboy cassette player. Uh, it it sound it sounds great. It is very sad, which is funny because I don't think it was composed to be that way. This record is in no way a reaction to Caleb's death as a, a good a, a good amount of it was was finished prior to you know this being uh being released you know but i don't know it, it's it's but it does have a little bit of a forlorn sadness to it which is something that i'm probably just putting on it but i love it and i think yeah it fits in with with some of my favorite albums by the band so um yeah i mean all timer final thoughts on cave in dan Caven's one of the best bands ever, man. Like they, they go all over the place. If you're into heavy music or you're into more like mainstream rock music, Caven can do all of that stuff. And in a lot of times they can do it better than than a lot of the bands that you like already. So uh, if you want a hardcore band, they can be that for you. If you want a if you want a space rock band, they can be that for you. If you want a prog band, they can do that for you sometimes. Uh <laughs> and uh, I think overall that it's it's one of the most interesting discographies to go through that we've done on this show because of the amount of diversity on it and the lack of predictability from one album to the next. We throw the word progressive around way too much on this show because it applies. There's something to be said for a band that can work within their genre to create something new and original. The Hope's Fall comparison is present when you're listening to Cave In. Even when the band was trying to be full on metalcore, I was reminded of the first time I sat down and really listened to Mike Oldfield, Tubular Bells, and all of his other works. And knowing that he created these atmospheric pieces at times by himself, because he had access to the equipment to build these soundscapes and put these ideas on tape, that was the same feel that I get when I'm listening to Cave In. 
it's a band that very easily could work within the genre and they tried one time but then they decide to do their own thing whatever that is today and it lays back in a way that might remind you of hum it might remind you of atmospheric bands but at the end what is it it's cave in and if the band is that original that they can make their own mark inside of a genre that everybody else enjoys listening to and enjoys playing that makes them truly an original band so you should be listening to cave in dan what's your album of the week i don't know man i've been really stuck on this spirit box album uh eternal blue it's slowly becoming one of my favorites and i don't care how many people don't like that i like it for me it's acidity by a band called keckle so you know a dream for a moment absolutely taking it way back in the day i love that record so much dude it is one of the weirdest experiences i've ever had and i'm glad that i had it i remember keckle being the band that would show up and play with a laptop for a drummer and that was all you had to say still brought the house down (laughs) take us out dft If you guys like this podcast and you want to give us some suggestions or tips or just tell us how we're doing, you can reach out to us at facebook.com slash discography discussion. You can join the discography discussion official group there. Uh, You can also send us an email at Dan and Joe show at gmail.com. We can be found on Twitter at discuss metal as well as on Instagram. Also at discuss metal. And uh, you can always join our discord server. There'll be a link in the show notes. that will take you to our discord server. And if you want to get some sweet discography discussion merch, you can also, follow the link in our show notes that'll take you to our teespring store where they make high quality merch for us on demand that goes straight to you and on that note this has been episode 243 of discography discussion thank you for listening you can like us on facebook and follow us on twitter at discuss metal subscribe to our podcast everywhere you listen to podcasts including google play apple podcasts and stitcher Visit DiscussMetal.com for all things discography discussion. And please send questions and comments to Dan and Joe Show at gmail.com. If you are not a patron, you can become one at Patreon.com forward slash Discuss Metal. We have some sweet perks. Hey, Joe, I just really need some, some money. $1 a month gets you into that exclusive album review feed. 